morning, everyone. Morning. 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 We call this work session to order. Thank you for being here this morning. Public comment, clerk. Do we have public comment? Yes, ma'am. We have three mm -hmm. citizens on here. Okay, we have three citizens this morning. We respect our citizens' right to address their government in this meeting. And however, I intend to enforce the three minute rule in order for this meeting to run efficiently and effectively. Once you reach your three minutes, uh, the poll will be taken back by me. And please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against officials, which should be handled in another form other than a business uh, meeting of this body. First on our list, we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, if you could come forward, please, to the podium, state your name and uh, your subject matter. I believe this morning is coroner training. Well, let's just see where we're going to start. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. And fellow council people. My name is Larry Pierce. 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Now, you know, I've been around a while, and I like this book. Attorneys use it. It's called Black Slum. And uh, just for a little anecdote, I got that book from Mr. Bill Posey after he died. He died in my house, <coughs> and he left me some books. Anyway, I didn't think you're allowed to use a term. The term is lie. Because I thought lie was an acronym for sarcastic, you know, calling somebody a name or something of that nature. I thought lie was really a slang. Well, it's not. And I just found it this weekend. Lie is an untruth deliberately told the uttering or acting of that which is false for the purpose of deceiving intentional misstatement. Now, you see this here? I made it up almost a month ago. Last night from 7 o'clock till 10, and I don't ever work past 10, the sharks come on, and I love that program. Two weeks ago, you had this, this, and this, okay? You see the red in there? I squeezed it all in last night. It's very interesting though, you know? It's a good thing I'm kind of an investigator, or maybe an agitator. Depends on what side of the fence you're on with me. All right, this over here is where the corner went, okay? For training. You see this over here, Ray Gushry? He's the guy over at Willie Watkins Funeral Home. He was the last one she hired. And you see Will, Mr. Rogers, and you see Mr. Mike Axley. They all went for training too. Um, not this year yet, it's coming up. But these three that's in the red, guess where they went? They went down here in Forsyth, Georgia. About an hour and a half if there's a lot of traffic around the airport. That's where the police academy is. All three of them went down there. That's where it's at. That's where you're supposed to go. You see this island club? You see this going up? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Every one of these is almost three times the amount right here and here. Now, why do you want to go there? Same reason people want to go to Disneyland. Now, let me tell you something. I asked a friend of mine the other day, I said, what is the coroner and what is a medical examiner? Well, some of you might think, medical examiner? Hmm, must be a doctor. Well, he is and he isn't. Depends on his degrees. But a medical examiner performs autopsies. A medical examiner knows terms you and I can't even pronounce. A coroner, on the other hand, can be any one of you in the next election to run and you will get your training. And you know what the training's about? Like I told you before. Right here, okay? Mr. And the Pierce. training. Mr. Pierce. Let me finish this, please, ma'am. Mr. Pierce, you have you had 44 seconds over. I've allowed you. Okay. <clears throat> so training. Mr. Pierce. Is to find out suspicion. All right? In closing, I just would like to say this. Thank you. See these glasses? 
if some of y'all will start opening your eyes and put them on by focus and take wax out of your ears and start hearing what people are saying, you're going to learn a few things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. See you in two weeks. All right, we'll take this matter revised, but I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. I'm giving me that. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. I work hard for my three minutes. <laughs> Today I gave you a treat that was 44 seconds over. And um, so I, it really was a great presentation. Um, Mr. John Tomaski, are you here? <coughs> there you are. Please come forth and give us your address and your subject matter. Uh, John Tomaski, 650 Stewart Parkway. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Madam Chairman, could you give me a sign at two minutes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, on the 27th, uh, there will uh, be a, an exhibit on Black History Month here. That's uh, Tuesday of next week. And uh, I was in Kroger early in the month, and I saw a poster there that referred to Black Heritage Month. And to me, that seemed a little more appropriate. Uh, from its inception, uh, Black History in February, well, uh, what do we teach the rest of the year? What history do we teach then? Uh, and although there are different interpretations of events, each event is unique. So there is only one actual history, apart from interpretation. And events should be included in school curricula according to their historical significance. And I find that much history in school is taught with a political bias to the extent that much is actually myth. And I had a discussion with one of my son's elementary school teachers. Uh, this was a black woman uh, who was uh, very knowledgeable about <coughs> elements of black history. And I asked her, uh, you do know uh, for example, you know, such and such, and she says, yes, I do, and I said, well, uh, why uh, do you teach only that? And she said, well, the state does not permit me to go beyond the curriculum. Now, it's a fact that the Union had five slave states, and the Emancipation Proclamation applied only to states that were not under federal control. So the Emancipation Proclamation actually freed no one, but the person did re-enslave people who had been freed by the military governor, which Lincoln had appointed, in Missouri. The 14th Amendment, uh, which uh, was a voting amendment, has a political deceit in it, mm -hmm. which is rarely mentioned. During Lincoln's time, true emancipators worked with him, particularly Frederick Douglass. There was also Harriet Dublin, Sojourner Truth, as real liberators. And how often are they mentioned? Among the very first Americans, killed leading up to the American Revolution was a black man. How many hear his name during Black History Month? I hope that when we get into history that we include all people who are significant and not use Black History Month <coughs> as a vehicle to actually propagate some of the myth. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, <coughs> we will take your concern and advisement. Last but not least, we have Mr. DeWitt uh, Rofer. Thank you. He's here. Uh, his subject matter is county decision. And Mr. Roper, if you could just give us your address. 6826 Cedar Mountain Road. Yes, sir. As I was here for the July work session where the buses were discussed, I came because I heard about the bike pass. At that meeting, uh, we were somewhat lectured about priorities for the second half of that meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think priorities should always be priorities. Uh, shouldn't be bells or whistles. Priorities should put paving dirt roads 
and I needed above I needed bike pass priority should be replacing the county light bulb before lighting seven and a half miles of bike pass if you remember I set up in time to get a light bulb replaced for three years at the intersection of Darks and Cedar Mountain Road you were going to get back to me with that I hadn't heard from anybody priority should be given seniors on one side of the county a senior center that has none priority should be a commission that tells a part of the county government they can operate with the same amount of personnel as the, as the uh, previous coroner did and uh, as far as the truck pass y'all had years and years knowing it's going to close the Mosley crossing and here we are now with no truck pass above 78 highway north of 78 highway and uh, if somebody could tell us what the routes are planning on I, with my neighbors would like to know what those routes are Okay. And if you can get back to me on the traffic light, I mean, it's not a traffic light, it's a county light bulb. It's just a light bulb. Uh, this is going on four years. Still waiting on a light bulb. Okay. Well, exactly okay. where is that address? Okay. Cedar okay. Mountain and Doris yeah, Road. Yeah. Okay, we got it. I need your. Uh, and while that light bulb was out, if I may, somebody on. ran through that intersection, through the front of my store, and almost out the back. So I'd like to get it replaced. And Mark, can you get the information about yes. the update on the... Uh, That's coming up in okay. just a second. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Mosley. We'll take your... Uh, Mr. Roper, we'll take this matter under advisement. And uh, a lot of the information you have, we're getting you to write it down. Thank you. Uh, Mark, do we have everything? County Administration. Yeah, we have Yeah, it. so there's nine million. Okay. I know it's nine million. All right. Well, that is... That's all for our, our citizen comments today. So we'll move forward to presentations. We have one presentation this morning by um, for Splost update, and that's Rich Belay. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the uh, Board of Commissioners. Uh, my name is Rich Bolane. I'm with Moreland and Belly, and I'm here to give you an update on the Splost program. Uh, all work through the end of January 31st. But before I get started, I just want to introduce one of our new team members, Elena Thompson. Uh, comes to us from H.J. Russell. You all remember Kent Gomez. Kent turned in his resignation, and he's moved on. And Elaine has joined our team. She'll be working with us on a regular basis. So I just wanted her to, you all to meet her. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, getting started with the update. got it divvied up. The fire department, $32 million right now. We've got budgeted about $31.6. Transportation, $51 million. We're about $30 million because we have those large buckets of money that we're still unobligated. And parks and rec, $17 million. Right now we're looking at about sixteen nine. dollars And then the program management expenses for the six years, about four point two. million. So we've got the program. We were thinking about $106 million program. Right now I think we're at eighty. million. $83 million actually program for budget. Uh, with that, to date, we've spent about $4.1 million. So uh, we're roughly about 5% done. And then breaking it up into the different uh, areas, you'll see the fire EMS, uh, we've spent about $460,000 to date. Transportation, we're much higher than that. We're just under $3 million. Uh, and you'll hear about the resurfacing program. That's the bulk of the money. And then Parks and Rec, we are about $150,000 with Parks and Rec. So uh, that's the division going to the three. Uh, here's our revenue collection dollars. Uh, you see, we, we were running under. And then we had a very good month last month of December. The December sales tax revenues came in about $4.5 million. Here's the summation of the first Splash year. You can see December we were $2.45 million. That was the best month we've had. Uh, thanks to all the holiday shopping. Here it is on a bar chart. Uh, you can see here's the uh, December. 
Rachel, thank you guys. Everybody Rachel. excited. You said 4.5. You said 4.5. And they said 4.4. 4.45. Two. 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 Again, we were projecting the first year <laughs> of 1.99 was our monthly average, or about 24 million for the year. Right now, we are $300,000 behind where we should be after the nine months of collection. So, our estimation we were projecting right now, we should be about 17.9 million. We're at 17.6. So, December had a great impact on where we were. And, uh, and monthly, we're about $35,000 behind where we expect it to be of the $1.99 million. So great month. Let's see what happens in January. We should get those numbers next week, uh, hoping with all the returns and the gift cards and everything like that. I'm not sure it'll be 2.4, but hopefully it'll be higher than what we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. so. so get rich real quick. That's 10 months worth of data. Or nine months. Nine. <coughs> nine. Nine. Through, through the end of these. Because we're always a month behind with the collections. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Our bond payment, repayment program hasn't changed. We still made the uh, first payment. And we've got our second payment due you know, on April 1st. And we have that $8.5 in escrow sitting, waiting to be paid back. So mm -hmm. that hasn't changed. Bond payment balance goes down, and then the splash funds go down as we spend the money. Okay, moving into the projects. Okay, the first project is the digital radio system. Uh, the digital radio system, this is the uh, TUSA contract, 250000 uh, We've almost got them paid to date. They're uh, a couple of months behind on their invoicing to us. Not a problem. And... Uh, the money they have left is for the construction inspection and engineering, which will take place during the course of the digital radio system. Uh, the digital radio system they had a kickoff meeting. Uh, notice to proceed will be given next month in March, so they'll get started middle of March. They're showing an 18-month duration, so we're looking at a end of September 2019 for that digital radio system to actually come online. And uh, if you remember, we had a budget of 16 and a half million. We're looking at 15 and a half million, so uh, uh, good opportunity there. Ambulance procurement, the ambulance is here, yes. done. Uh, we've paid the bill, so uh, Chief's got a new ambulance in service, so we're, we're good there. Once we finalize all the money on this, we'll close this one out, and we'll go on to the 2018 procurement. The pumper truck, uh, the pumper truck was running late. The pumper truck is in Winder, Georgia, as we speak. A uh, couple of quick modifications should be here later this week. Yes, sir. So uh, we'll have the new pumper truck ready to go into operation. And then the new ladder truck, the aerial truck. Uh, the two chiefs, you guys went up to Wisconsin last week, final inspection. And it's my understanding it is going to leave Wisconsin tomorrow. And depending on how much snow they have on the way down, hopefully that the ladder truck will be here in Douglas County uh, by the end of the week also. So uh, those three pieces of equipment will be here and go into operation. So. Okay. <coughs> I'm not as fast as the clicker. Uh, station three renovations. Uh, we put that out for bid. <laughs> Bids came in much higher than we thought. If you remember, our budget was about 200000 uh, All the bids came in about two and a half times that. They were about 550000 600000 uh, I had our, our <coughs> sub-consultant, H.J. Russell, uh, I gave them the plans. I gave them the specs. They wanted all kinds of information. I said, I'm not telling you anything. Here are your plans. Here are your specs. I want you to give me an independent bid. Their independent bid came back at $640,000. So what we're doing now is we're looking at opportunities to value engineer this. What can we live without? What can we take out it to get the price down? And then I need to talk with uh, Chief Spencer. This comes out of his 200, or not 200, his $2 million pot of money for renovations that we were figuring 350000 a year for the six years. I want to talk to Chief. Do you want to take 
two years of your budget for one project. So between value engineering it down and taking a look at what it is, uh, I've got to get with the chief to determine what do they want to do. They really want to spend that much money for this facility and spend all their money in one place as opposed to maybe we need to scrap it and do something else with the money. So I'll be working with the chief on that to figure out just what path we're going to proceed in. So, yeah. But that was station three renovations. It shocked all of us. So, And we had nine or ten bidders on it. So, uh, you know, I, I thought maybe somebody made a mistake, but when you have ten bidders come in and an independent estimate, it's probably worth five or six hundred thousand dollars for the project. But we'll be working on that and uh, figure out what we're going to do, and then we'll come back to the board with uh, our recommendations. Station two re-roofing, that's done and complete, paid for. New fire station signage, that is uh, Extreme Images. They're working on it. Uh, last I heard, they're about halfway through, and uh, they should finish that up by the end of this month. And then station four roof replacement, that's also done. And then the fire safety house, uh, I kept it on the board for one more month. I just wanted, I don't know if you all saw it, but Linda Stouffer with WSB came out and did a great interview with the chief and uh, some of his fire EMS and uh, was showing how it went to the school and how they teach the kids how to get out of a house if this happens and that happens and to always have a plan. So uh, I thought it was great publicity, great press, and uh, fantastic. And it looked so good on TV, too. But that'll be the last time you see that. It's always nice to get good news. Moving into transportation. First project is the resurfacing program. The resurfacing is done for the year. They finished the striping. They finished the raised pavement markers. There's still some punch lists to do. So uh, there's still one more invoice that'll get processed. But as we said, uh, once they get the punch list done, we'll process the last uh, invoice. So, uh, and we're still looking at about $3 million or less for the annual paving program. So uh, that one uh, just about complete. Uh, splash year two, 2018, working on the list. You're working on the quantities and working through the transportation committee and then it'll be coming up to the board. Uh, so it's working through its process and then uh, the recommendation will be coming to the board. Remember the last meeting there was some discussion about the paving program. So. Okay. Next up, Riverside Parkway Streetlights. Went through there last week. They're moving the project forward. They're putting the conduit in, the wires in, and the light poles are going up in the air. So uh, they're still working. We were projecting about April 1st completion into March. So uh, we're just tracking them and uh, following their progress. So they're moving through. Riverside Parkway, Rockhouse Road traffic signal. That one's actually a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, last week, the signal poles were actually delivered to the project. The road widening is being done. So uh, we're actually expecting a uh, early completion. We were thinking towards the end of May, but it should be sooner than that. Uh, weather keeps hanging out and get good weather, it'll be all right. Uh, moving on to intersections and operations, Stewart Mill Road. Uh, this is the Jacobs. We have an agreement with Jacobs. We're processing the paperwork to get them started on the design and complete this job so we can get it out on the street for bid. But we do have a deal with uh, Jacobs. Bright Star Road, John West, Southeast Engineering is designing this as we speak. Uh, currently, we're expecting the concept drawings early March. So uh, we got a March 6th date for the uh, concept. We'll take a look at that. And uh, that design is moving forward. Sweetwater Church, Doris Road, Miguel, I think you have a meeting this week to discuss. Uh, they were minute. They were redesigning some things to minimize the impacts to the right of way take to the right of way takes. And then uh, uh, Douglas County and Paulding County are meeting later this week to go through that so that we hopefully get this job moved forward. Okay, Chapel Hill Road. Same thing with uh, Southeast Engineering. They are does, they're in design with this project. And we are expecting the first concepts in early March. So uh, they finished the, uh, the uh, surveying and uh, they're working on concept reports. Post Road Bridge at Dog River, no change. 
uh, still looking for GDOT to uh, award this as a design build May of this year. So it'll get started in a design build. The three schools, Lithia Springs Elementary, Chestnut Log Middle, and New Manchester High School. Uh, if you all remember, we were working a plan B where we didn't have any design engineers who responded to our proposal, request for proposal. Uh, we were working a plan B. As we worked this plan B of trying to do the work without any design, we kept running into roadblocks and we, we finally came to the conclusion, we gotta get something designed. So we've reached out to a number of the local design engineers and we've actually put this, we're gonna put this job back out on the street and uh, get the design work done. Every time we turned a corner, it was like, gotta have some sort of design. Uh, WSA, I knew we had, to, had, they were like, no, you guys need a design and stuff like that. So every time we turned a corner, we just, so we've reached out to a number of folks. We're gonna put it back out on the street and get some people to bid on it so that we can do it. Originally plan A. So we're just gonna put it back out on the street. <coughs> Transportation equipment. Uh, the only thing that remains for the first flush here, I think you've got a couple of pickup trucks on order and uh, that will complete the, uh, the transportation equipment procurement for the year. Okay. Moving into Parks and Rec. First one is the Boundary Waters restroom from Central Stand Press Box and the soccer field lighting. Uh, Carter Watkins is working on the design of that. They did give us a concept and uh, we're value engineering some things out of there. This is the project where we're doing, we're marrying up the two projects and getting both projects done with the original summation of the two budgets. So the restroom was 650 and the soccer field lighting was one, 650 and 160. So we got 810,000 and uh, we're just, we're working the two projects jointly. Next up is Deer Lake Park tennis courts and resurfacing. This is actually back out on the street. We've uh, talked to a number of folks in the architect engineering community and uh, they were very apologetic for not bidding it up the first time, but we've talked to a number of folks, they're gonna bid it the second time. So uh, I think our bids are due March 16th. So it's, it's actually back out on the street. We'll be taking bids on the 16th to uh, get the engineering services and design services. <coughs> Multi-purpose rec center. Multi-purpose rec center is still with the evaluation committee and the recreation committee. Uh, as soon as it gets through them, it will come to the board for uh, recommendation for award, but uh, it's still with, still with the committee. And then the senior center, uh, we've got a number of proposals on that and the proposals are still in the scoring phase and uh, then that'll be going to the recreation committee too. So. Uh, uh, both of those will be moving forward in the spring. Bill R. Park and uh, Fair Play Park. This is Alan Bell doing the design of the restrooms and the concession stands. And Los and Associates doing some fence work in, on here. So both of these are in design. And uh, again, we'll see some uh, drawings fairly soon. And then Post Road Park. Uh, we have some score boxes. We only have a $24,000 budget. We met with Gary last week and moving forward with getting those uh, procured. So uh, those will be happening this spring. And then Gary's got uh, a little bit of budget left for miscellaneous equipment purchases. I think he's got two trucks that are due in a little bit, a couple of months down the road, but uh, they should be delivered soon. And then the last is our program management expenses. And uh, you can see we've we're still running under our budget to uh, make the money last longer. And I know Bill Peacock and Vicki Moreland are in conversation as we winding down with the first yearly budget that they'll get the second budget for the second splash years allocated. So uh, <coughs> with that, I believe that's it on the update for the month of January. Any questions from the board commissioners? Commissioner <coughs> Guider? Yes. <coughs> Which um, station three uh, was the plan to just tear it down and rebuild? No, it's an addition. It's, it's, it's an, an addition. addition. Yes. But uh, you had mentioned that the radio was gonna was under budget, like half a million dollars. <coughs> Could some of that savings not be applied to that? I think Bill Arp is one of the oldest stations 
we have out here. That's a possibility. It could be, <coughs> yes. And that's why I've got to talk to the chief. If we, you're going to realize some savings on the radio. If you want to move some of that money into the $2 million mm -hmm. renovation budget, we could certainly do that and then move forward with the. But is, I think it is one of the oldest ones we yes. have out here. Um, on the Reynolds um, Stuart Mill Road um, intersection, you said it was, um, you were talking with Jacobs. Yes. And that uh, the design is moving forward. Have they given you an estimated time? The design is not moving forward. We have an agreement in place of $110,000 to complete the design and the paperwork is in the process of being executed so that we can get the, de we can finish the design. The design's, I don't know, 75%. Isn't it just extending the culvert just, uh, to widen it? Uh, There's a little bit more involved in A little bit more than that. But um, it just seems like it's really, uh, <laughs> it's been on hold for so long. It, it's and been frustrating getting them to finalize the deal to get the But uh, they haven't given you an estimated time that they can uh, get the redesign. It doesn't <coughs> seem like a redesign would take quite as long as a, yeah. it's, a, it's a completion. design from the ground up. So. It's a completion of the existing design, but what they're doing there is, they're, they're inheriting or they're taking over. They bought out the company who did the original design. So now they're going to finish this design that they're, you know, they have to check what the other people did. So it's not a redesign, but it's a completion of somebody else's work. That's always touchy in the engineering profession. So you don't have it even in time table? Or the only thing they've told us. Guess. The only thing they've <laughs> told us is it'll take about four to five months to complete once they get started on it. It's one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and be about four or five months once they get started. Now, when they get started, I'm not sure when that'll be, but it's about a four or five month duration. To finish it up. You need to push them. I've, I've been pushing. <laughs> this is like I say. This yeah. is such a dangerous intersection. I need to kick them is what I need to do. Get pushing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll talk to them. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and on the post road bridge, you say the award should be the design award should be out by May. They're going to start in the spring. Uh, it'll so, be a design build. So have they even started, the, like, their survey? Have they been surveying and looking they, at the right away? They did some surveying early on. Uh, they haven't been out lately. Uh, it's in the procurement. It'll be in the procurement phase, and it'll, it'll be out on the street in May or June of this year. Okay. And Mr. I forgot who you said is doing the Fair Play Park. Uh, Alan Bell. Alan Bell, okay. Uh, so he's doing that and Bill Art Park. Correct. Okay, because those are two different districts, but anyway. Correct. Um, <coughs> and when do you think that that design will be ready? He's been working on it. It'll be probably another month or two. Okay. Should be done. For and the then year. once the design is out there, you will put it out to bid as far as what? Uh, put it out for bid for construction. Yeah. But there was a lot of work that need, was needed down at Fair Play. I know the lights was one of the biggest things. Um, have, are we not moving forward with the lights? We don't know. I don't remember the if the lights are the design, I guess. <laughs> we have a scope of work for each of those parks. I, I can't remember what's specifically on that one right now. Okay. I'm not sure the lights are included. All right, I yield back. Thank okay. you. Any other questions for Commissioner Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> a couple of quick questions. Um, it, Riverside um, street lights, specifically. Uh, I did come down them this weekend, and they seem like they're all. I didn't count them all, but it looks like they're moving along. Um, with that being said. Um, one more time for maintenance. How do, how do, and Mark, maybe you can weigh in on this once we're up and going. Um, at, at what point will this officially be done, meaning a SPLOS project and it really becomes responsibility of the county? When they're up and lit or what? Can you explain that? I think <coughs> it's, uh, no, it's, it will be their poles. Their poles? Yes, it will be their poles. We wouldn't maintain them. All right, so we just have utility. Um, we pay the utility bills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify that to see if there was any other additional cost with that. Okay. So, again, April 1st, Rich? 
give or take. <laughs> give or take. I understand. I mean, yeah. it, it's no problem. It's, it, it, and it's, it, it, a comment was made earlier <clears throat> by one of our citizens, and I, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, when we do say priorities, that this was part of the SPLOS that was put on the list um, that was voted on by citizens um, at large, at least for the SPLOS, not necessarily projects. But uh, to, to staff, there, there are times when, again, there's presentation and there's pitches to the Board of Commissioners, but also there's feedback the other way. And when I hear citizens, it, it, you, know, it, it, you know, it feels like they feel forsaken. Right? And that, that shouldn't be the case, right? You got a thousand people, half of public safety. And I, while I heard it, it was like, okay, but that should be caught, right? That, that, that's something that should have been caught, that if it's a public safety issue or something, it, it shouldn't have to be, they have to come back down a year later and say, hey, but what about? So I, I heard the citizen, like, okay. And I, I think staff, y'all gotta help us manage this. Right? But one more time, we're only here part time. Right? So there's got to be a catching mechanism that acknowledges these things versus these moments like this that says, like, okay, well, one's not related to the other, but your point is well taken. That's what to make that point. I'm going to move on. All right, second, um, as it relates to, all right, so we're going to go back out to bid for the, um, the elementary schools. And I just, are you going to expand the web of who you're going after? Meaning, outside the county, how are you going to do this? Because again, nobody really responded. I know you got to come up with a design, but I'm just curious how, how, how we're going to get that done. We've reached out to about half a dozen firms yep. who actually <clears throat> bid on the senior center and the rec center. And they were very apologetic, but what they said was, we'd like to do that work, but they were busy working on the bigger projects and they missed this one. We also reached out to some <coughs> smaller local folks and said that you could certainly do this work. And so we have a combination of some of the folks who were bidding on the other projects and then some local folks who just missed it. And uh, now that they've seen it re-advertised, uh, they were going to put proposals in. And okay. Okay, that, um, that we're nodding. Okay, sounds good on that one. And my last point, I, I won't, um, um, and I, it sounds like our committee structure is working in that we're gonna, there's gonna be a formal recommendation on the community center um, at some point. And this is a recommendation for the a &E. Correct. Right. As part of that, and again, not trying to get ahead of it, but as part of that, I just wanna make sure there will be, will there be citizen, was there a requirement, maybe this is a, a direct repeat out, was there a requirement that says that there must be, there's an expectation that community feedback will go into the actual design, or maybe that's already happened, I don't know. But will they have a chance, in other words, will the architects come back and say, okay, here's your design, or will there be real input from the citizens? I mean, put the functional side, we want, you know, a bathroom, we want those things. I mean, I yes. think you know what I'm saying, the design elements. Will, will citizens have a chance to partake? Okay. Yes. We, that's already taken place. We've had some meetings where we got some great comments from uh, some local folks. But once we award the contract, whoever the designer is, they'll get started on their concept drawings. Once we get the concept drawings in, we'll have design charrettes with the public, uh, probably down the boundary waters, have people come in, see the, what, the, what, the facility, what their concept looks like, and then we'll just, you know, you'd be in a room like this, we'll have uh, boards up and we'll show them what we're, what we're thinking, and it'll give them the opportunity to take a look at what the designer's thinking, and if they have any other ideas that we can get incorporated <coughs> into, we'll do that. Can I get a copy, um, offline, can I get a copy of, maybe it's in the committee, a copy of the actual input that went into that, that you said you captured and who got it? <coughs> Thank you. Are you? Commissioner okay. Mitchell. And keeping on the same thing, with the same type of a makeup, uh, same thing with the Senior Citizen Center and so on, so that way everybody can at least have some input. Yep, absolutely. To, to assure that which, which we're doing or considering is something that's an interest to the general public. Okay. Uh, my other question, going back to the, um, the sidewalks. So I'm glad to hear that, uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with going back to the, <coughs> the sidewalks versus are we anticipating or thinking that the numbers may change or um, I, I hear that most of, some or many forgot <laughs> or didn't have time and didn't see it, but what, what are we expecting out of this outside of the cost at one time were extremely high based on what we 
receive the first time around. Well, on the sidewalks, no, yes. we didn't get any bids on the sidewalks. That's right, correct. Right. right, you're right, so, we didn't get any. So. And we, we did the same thing. We called the running folks, and, and now they're going to pursue giving us a proposal. So your approach with the locals in trying to do the sidewalks still created a problem with the PME side of it. It, 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 it wasn't an issue with the local contractors. Every Everything we ran up against, we needed a design. Yeah. We, we needed to have a, a, a construction design. We needed a civil design in order to prosecute the work. So now, we tried right. to get away without without doing any design or minimal design. And, and every time we turned the corner, it was like, you know, there was a roadblock of why we needed to have the design. So so that, that additional cost would also still put you in a, a, a unique situation with trying to get this done uh, not only efficiently, but in the realm of the numbers and what we're dealing with, right? Yes, and, and this comes out of that post-road bridge bucket of money okay. where we save some money on that post-road bridge and uh, we really don't have a budget allocated for the sidewalk work. Right. It comes out of that $8 million bucket of money. Yeah. So and the design really wouldn't be an additional cost because no. we originally planned to have it. So it's included. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we originally okay. planned to okay. have that. Okay. Because I guess it might be a bit of an additional cost, but you say it's already. It's yeah, already yeah. we originally yeah. planned it, tried it, didn't get any uh, responses. <coughs> then we talked to actual contractors. You know, one's on state route. We definitely have to have design there. There's uh, covert issues. There's topographic issues, slope issues. So we've got to have design. There. Now, would it be also beneficial to us to also, in, in making this request, if you guys are bidding on the other stuff? That's dealing in the parks and rec. That maybe say, okay, if you tie this in, that costs you. You will get some additional funding to get this, this smaller project done, but also it may benefit you to bid on this and get that. So you kind of do a, a combo type of deal. I don't know. You know, you guys are the experts. I don't. Is that is that is that? It's a possibility. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Sir. Sure. Um, uh, one other thing. So with the numbers coming in for December, which were great, uh, which offset. But we have been losing behind. Yeah, we were behind. And really, was it 35 or something? We were originally about $600,000 behind no, schedule on the collections. Now we're half that. We're only about right. 300000 behind. Great. Okay. So that's, that's a huge. On about 18 million. <clears throat> gotcha. Gotcha. So that's a, that's a huge. Uh, that's, a, that's a good update to kind of know that part of it. Yep. And, and also, will you continue, which I hope that you do, continue to um, look at those. Uh, Local contractors, the Douglas Billions, the minorities, and the, and the, and the um, uh, those local businesses to assure that we're still goals trying to get the locals and the minority business and others in, engaged in this whole process so we won't lose out because we had to go a different route to yes. get there. So, absolutely, I'll continue. We actually updated it for this month, there wasn't much change from okay. last month. But I will present it again next month. Yeah, just Absolutely. Don't, just don't 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 lose. Uh, oh no. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep that uh, yeah. keep that in mind. Um, so give us uh, Outside of that, I'll I'll, I'll yield back. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dider. Yes, I forgot to ask. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that the uh, paving, the resurfacing part would go to the transportation and then to the board. Uh, I think we clarified this in our last meeting. It goes to district commissioners, then to the transportation, then to the board. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah. the transportation committee will be discussing the budget um, on Tuesday because right now I think we're way over, <coughs> a little bit over budget, so we've got to decide what recommendation we we'll, you know, that the transportation committee wants to go as far as the budget's concerned. But as far as the actual streets that are on the list, no, those will go to the district commissioner. So uh, you're saying we're not going to have the three million? Is that what you're saying? No, right now I think we're the estimate that we come up with for the streets that we have proposed is a lot higher than that. Okay. Well, you and I read rode out and we saw some of the roads in Douglas County and they're through roads you know, uh, they're the main roads and everything in the western side embarrassing were they not a couple of them yeah they're embarrassing but there's there's roads all over the county that's 
Mm -hmm. Well, we're working there's 7,000 <clears throat> There's 7,000 on South Flat Rock Road a day because we had a count uh, a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I yield back. Thank you. Mark, this is a question for you. I believe you, are, you have a list that we're pulling together, a pretty robust list for District 4 for some of those areas that we identified. I believe you said, um, what is his name? Um, Lamar, what is the guy that's LaVon. LaVon, I'm so sorry. But he's already compiling the list and you're supposed to be, I think you're working on them now if it's not raining. Well, there's that's two separate issues. One was the yeah. some of the shoulders and the patch, and, and Miguel and LaVon's working on the, the uh, splash resurfacing list. Okay. And the shoulders. Yeah, yeah okay. the shoulders are already a separate, separate issue, but he has to work on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Well, yeah, no. The Ch Chest Days Committee will be meeting tomorrow at 2 o'clock as a standard meeting, uh, which is our um, um, the third Tuesday of, for the most part every month. Um, the intent, at least for this particular meeting, is it is on the agenda for, for the record. Um, to review what staff is bringing before us is um, our standard process as it relates to roads. Um, as is always for at least 10 years I've been here, um, the district commissioners will weigh in on their roads. We have no insight in each other's roads what the priority is. Our goal in the transportation committee is really the budget. It's to make sure properly, like we didn't experience three years ago when we went beyond what we had allocated because we stretched it. We fell short 2.3 million. All right, so when, the, when, when it's off, you may have an expectation that we're going to do these amount of roads, and the district commissioners have that right. But when that budget comes back, it says, no, we only got <coughs> two million. That means that there needs to be a priority cut, and that be within your power, within your district, which you're going to come out. But what we can't do is, and again, that was a bad place to be, and I think this is worthy for the whole room, is to ever put ourselves in a place where, okay, the budget came in a little bit more than the estimates came a little bit more than what we budgeted and stuff. Let's go ahead and stretch it. And okay, let's go look at Jennifer Holman and direct finance. Like, okay, let's go find this money. And then something else gets knocked down. And then we look up like one day and say, okay, what happened? We should never be in that place. We should have never been $2.3 million short because we stretched. That's material, right? Because we didn't have the wherewithal to just cut the roads. We're trying to overpromise. We got $3 million worth of splash resurfacing. That's well above and beyond what we've ever had for the past 10 years, right? We recognize that. We know the roads are deteriorating. We're doing the best we can to make these, these roads work. Uh, we recognize one of our districts happens to be, uh, uh, has a lot more roads. Um, obviously, we know that's a function of redistricting. Uh, that's specifically tied to how the map was written. But it's the same amount of people, right? Same amount of people. And so it's important that we you know we work together with this. I think the process will work um, if we just work the process. <coughs> but we've got to separate the two. But 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 all means it's important that East District will have its representation as it always has, and it will weigh in. No committee is trying to take away any power from a specific district. You guys do what you have to do. The committee will do what it has to. Do. I yield back, Jerry. Okay. Any other comments before we move forward? All right. Thank you, Mr. Blank. You have the approval of the minutes, and I just encourage you to look at those, and then we will um, review them tomorrow, and the minutes will be approved accordingly. Public hearing, we have a public hearing tomorrow, um, and it's the purpose of considering amendment section 14-72 of the county's code of ordinances relating to zones prohibiting trucks. And that uh, will be presented, this will be presented by our, our director, Valentine. Good morning. Just tell us uh, what to expect regarding this hearing tomorrow. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about the extent of this uh, detour route, but all of the roads under consideration are really in the immediate vicinity of US 78 and 92. And initially, there, there was a, a route under consideration uh, that involved the city as well. It involved Municipal Parkway, Industrial Access Road, uh, and Huey Road, and Malone Road. However, after uh, meetings with the city and the DOT, and us going out there as well as the DOT with a semi and driving the routes, uh, the DOT favors the, the uh, route that involves only North Burnt Hickory Road, 
and Maroney Mill Road. And that is, after discussion with the Transportation Committee as well, that is the preferred route uh, that, that we are recommending. So for purposes of the uh, resolution that will be considered tomorrow, uh, that would be uh, the recommendation that, that the uh, detour route uh, resulting from the from the closure of the railroad crossing at Mosley Street involve only North Burn Hickory Road and Maroney Mill Road, and particularly because there are traffic signals at both ends of those, uh, the other the other route would have involved having to add a signal at Malone and 92. Uh, so this is what uh, what we're moving forward, what the recommendation is uh, for tomorrow. Uh, this uh, public hearing has been advertised, uh, duly advertised in, in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also reached out and sent letters to all the residents along Maroney Mill and North Burn Hickory, informing them of the uh, public hearing tomorrow. Uh, so potentially some of the uh, residents may be in attendance to uh, voice their opinion or any comments that may have. We have not received actually very many comment, uh, comments as it relates to uh, Maroney Mill and North Burn Hickory. <coughs> However, we've had a number of calls about residents in other areas of the county concerned about this, but again, it's only involving those two roads in the immediate vicinity of US 78 and Route 92. Okay. Any questions for Director Valentine from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner uh, Guido. Mm -hmm. I would just suggest that maybe you have a map that you can display uh, as you talk tomorrow. <coughs> to clarify. Okay. You know, just a, a map so that people can see what you're talking about. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell? Yeah, and I'll just only add, I appreciate the conversation and, and, and our conversation about this whole makeup and this um, uh, detour based on the mere fact of the G dot and others kind of chiming in the city and everybody else. Also, why don't you share with everybody about um, in the event that there's some damages to the roads we, we talked about um, because <coughs> my concern was who would actually be responsible for this two year later situation that we may encounter. So if you would share that conversation with the general public, if you would. Certainly, uh, Commissioner, to, to that end, uh, we mm -hmm. had discussions with the Georgia DOT and the city initially uh, the DFT came forward and acknowledged that any damage, uh, any repairs that would be required all along the detour route would be the responsibility of the DOT for the duration of the, of the uh, detour route. And in fact, one of the items on the agenda later on, on this very agenda, is an agreement with the Georgia DOT to that end. Right. And, and so we want to kind of clear that myth of who will be responsible at the end of the, the day because I. I know the damages that trucks can do, and especially if that's not a route that they should be on anyway, mm -hmm. uh, that it could be some damaging that we could encounter that we want to kind of get ahead of that. So, and from understanding, you guys will uh, do video, pictures, and everything else today, what it is versus what we deal with some two and three years later, depending upon how long it takes them to kind of get through with this whole on the path. In fact, we've already had a video of the entire route mm -hmm. as a record, uh, and we will do the same thing after the completion of the road uh, and uh, decommissioning of the detour route so that we can compare uh, existing conditions versus how it's left after the detour. Yeah. And, and last but not least, how, how are we going to notify or ensure that the truckers don't get off because this could be an easily uh, problem that, that they'll encounter not knowing that we've sent them the different direction. So are we doing any marketing or is it truckers or the, how do we make sure that these guys don't, don't get off course based on the mere fact of just the change that happened and they just didn't realize it. <laughs> In fact, the, the Georgia DOT is also going to be a, a participant reaching out to the trucking industry mm -hmm. and they rely on ways to, to get uh, uh, the app ways to get around uh, different uh, obstructions in the road, and that's how they're going to. That's how they're getting the message out to the truck. So they will be informed uh, during the duration of the detour that that is where they're supposed to be. Right. And uh, the same will happen up when when the detour is decommissioned. Right. Uh, they'll reach out to them and let them know for sure that that's no longer the case. Right. 
exactly. Okay, so long as we're communicating to those guys, because I don't want to see uh, the mere fact of us, you know, ticketing these guys just because uh, they're happen to get off course for whatever reason. So I hope we, you know, be empathetic at, at, at those guys as they're making those changes and, and, and trying to cut through it, whether it's in the city or in the county, wherever that is. So just understand that side of it. And how long does it supposedly last? I mean, I know we talked about this. That you want to it, it's probably going to be a couple of years. Right. Okay. So a couple of years of getting through this underpass depends on weather and a whole lot of other things and other factors that may deal with that. They go through this whole underpass. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Commissioner, obviously. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> Thinking back on, on Commissioner Mitchell's um, comment, and I'm, I'm going to lean to, um, we brought this up in, in our transportation, but it's, uh, Commissioner Walker, you may want to help with this, which is this ways, this, the reliability of this. Right? We have, we, we're dealing with trucks. Uh, we've had a conversation probably before you, Miguel, so be, be patient when I bring this up. It was more about this whole notion of revisiting the truck, um, doing cut-throughs and so forth, and there's always this notion, well, I'm lost, right? They got lost, and they're relying on the technology that we're, I know we live by it for the most part and finding our way around, but still, um, and I guess this is more of a policy question, which is, well, if you went down the wrong road, you went down a dead end, you whatever, and it, it, it just, what is the reliability between, I mean, how reliable is that system? In other words, I mean, do we take it for law? Or if you involuntarily do something wrong, it's like across the, the judicial, it's like, okay, involuntarily, whatever, you're still responsible, right? You, we, we tell them to be accountable for their actions across the hallway. Yet, here we are, we're giving passes on something that's, well, well, it's not my fault. Well, okay, but one more time. So it's more of a policy. Is, is how do we ensure, because we're, we're saying that we're putting a reliance on this, this, these ways and stuff, and I don't know enough about it, I'm not a technologist, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious is that, okay, but they get lost all the time. We get lost all the time, trying to get around using that as a technology for us. Um, and I, I guess my question is, um, back to maybe Commissioner Mitchell's point, which is, is there something we can have a higher confidence that this is going to work, mm -hmm. that, that we've done adequate education and we're doing adequate communication and then there's adequate ongoing support once we, this is done. Because I'm just, this is consistent. We have this little issue, this little issue, but it's all, the, it's all related. If you just listen to what has happened over the past two or three years regarding trucks and traffic, and, and, it's, and it's, it's not just relegated to this stop, I mean, to, to sort of this passage, um, it's all over. So what are your thoughts on that? How do we? Well, Commissioner, the, the detour route is going to be plainly marked, yeah. and there'll be advanced warning signs uh, uh, alerting motorists that the detour is coming up. So that's that's really what is intended to to guide them uh, to make the turn at, at, at the appropriate location. What Waze will do is go beyond that and anticipate that a trucker might be coming through this area and alert them to the fact that there's a detour. So they, the Waze is in addition to the typical signage that is set out on the, on the roadway. Uh, because trucking uh, is long distance in many, uh, in many instances, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to reach out to everyone who's going to be using that corridor. So um, using, relying on Waze and the connection between GDOT and their communications with the trucking industry that is, um, as deficient as that may be in some ways, no pun intended, um, it is the best um, means of alerting somebody that they are going to drive up to a situation that they should be aware of. Now, when they do, and if they do not pay attention to the app or the message, uh, they will see the same signs directing uh, them as all other traffic when they approach that area. Yes. Uh, re reason I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, we're thinking about the 166, was that 166, 92, we just, Lower River Road, right? Uh, and, and just the other day, I happened to be walking along in there, and there's a truck coming through there. Right? It wasn't delivering to the elementary school, and it definitely wasn't delivering to the cemetery and the church there. And so, it, it, I'm sure he was off, right? 
and he's coming through there. And so again, we have these big giant signs, we went through all this trouble, so this is just, that's anecdotal. That's just one instance, by no means am I saying that I, I don't believe in perfection like that. But again, it, it sounds like you guys, my peers, are comfortable with the fact that this technology in ways is, it, that's it. It, it. I mean, that's the best we can do. It's, it's, it's the best of perfection that we're gonna have right now and that, to your point, for the topic that we're talking about, in general, we're safe on the railroad, but more importantly, the broader policy across the county uh, it's the best we got. There's mm -hmm. nothing else more we can do, and it's better than what it is. Am I hearing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Yes, Mr. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, I'm just looking for a nod. Mm -hmm. All right. Then, then I just want to make sure, Miguel, and you see where we're going. This was somewhat before you, and we did, was a, a, we're just tying in lo these loose ends about truck traffic. <coughs> uh, and so, okay, well, y'all got peace. I, I yield now, Chair. Commissioner, that was next. Um, on that note. <laughs> Uh, Mark and I went out to South Flat Rock Road yesterday, and we've got signs, no trucks allowed. However, I am told that the uh, garbage trucks coming from Paulding County to the uh, station, that where they, the transfer station, they're off of 170, I think, that they cut through there. And that's why the road is just completely torn up. Um, and when they're loaded, uh, and, I, and I don't know how many axles uh, a dump, tr I mean a, a garbage truck has, do they qualify as an 18 wheeler? Not an 18 wheeler, but um, as a they're heavy trucks. So they're they're, they're very many, heavy. It depends they're right? on the truck, but 20, 20 to 22 tons per truck, right? But they're not supposed to be on that road. But the, instead of going up Cedar Mountain Road and Strickland or whatever, however they're supposed to go, they're coming uh, down a road that we, we have signage on. Now the, the sign on this end, on the city side, is set way back to where the city limits is. And so they may not see that sign until they've gone, uh, and gone several hundred feet and they can't turn around. But the other end is right there at uh, the <coughs> road, is it not? Yes, ma'am. But um, and we're going to talk to the city about. So I don't know what we can do about ways. that, but uh, they're actually they actually tear up our roads. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Commissioner, no, no question about that. The, the the restriction on trucks is for <coughs> through traffic. If they have business in that area. Uh, and there isn't another viable designated route for them to use, then, then they cannot be prohibited from going there. Uh, but they're using it as a through road. If they're, if they're using it as a through road, then that becomes an enforcement issue. I, I agree. Uh, to, to your point about the signage, we will, we will look to add a signage so that at least they don't have the excuse uh, that they, they didn't around. see the sign. Yeah. But, um, and Bobby, maybe you, you can get some trolling out there. <laughs> Especially if we repave it, we don't want it to tear it up. I would venture to say that road is patrolled more than most folks realize. But not for trucks. Well, you may not even know it's a no truck road. We run radar on it. Uh, we've been known to do that quite often down through there. Uh, just going from one end to the other. I mean, you're going to have trucks going to come through at times there's somebody not there, I'm sure that happens, but I don't know a way that you fix that unless you station somebody there. I mean, that's not reasonable. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so you're saying there's nothing you can do about it? No, we will have the sign <coughs> to, to make it more obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mulk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Geyer's got me, got, got me off on a, another topic, so what I was Starting to talk about, but let's let's talk about the uh, the uh, haulers and, and the fact that their truck weights are can be pretty considerable and, and frequently on roads that are not designed for it. I eat subdivisions. Jeez, you know, we'll have three or four different haulers coming into a subdivision. We perhaps we ought to have some kind of ordinance that requires. I don't know if it's legal, but uh, that requires uh, perhaps limiting to a subdivision to one hauler. And I'm not saying one hauler countywide, but I'm saying per subdivision to where we're not multiplying uh, heavy load trips on, on subdivision roads that are not designed for, 
for the for the heavy loading. <coughs> Specifically, this uh, this particular road segment. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I, I would think probably a lot of these haulers have uh, Douglas County business licenses. Uh, and it would seem to me uh, perhaps if we have an enforcement issue that we back up and go to the business licenses and, <coughs> and send some uh, forceful letters to the to the, uh, uh, the to the company explain to them what roads they're actually supposed to be used uh, supposed to be using and what roads they're not supposed to be using and that might that might help uh, now to the uh, to the reroute the uh, the detour segment uh, Human beings, you know, you know, be what they are. We we could put up all the signs in the world, and we can have the best technology. But uh, yeah, you know, the link is down, or you know, the it, it, mm -hmm. system is broken, or mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. any any number of things can happen. You know, the only fallback is, is what we put on the ground. So I would I would just suggest that if the route uh, by um, specification requires you know eight signs. That maybe we just go above and beyond that in terms of the sizes of the signs and the number of sizes, but I have to leave that to the professionals to discern that uh, that type of decision. But that's that's always the that's 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 on the ground decision, and uh, perhaps we can uh, expand a little more research uh, resources in uh, beefing up our signage, and that would be my suggestion. And uh, I yield back to chair. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Yeah. Okay. So I, I know we talk about. Um, there's no um, one way to fix this thing to kind of get this this uh, detour correct. So uh, I'm pleased with where we're going with it, at least doing everything we can to assure that we, we put it on the app, we put it in GPS, we notify uh, the sheriff know uh, the do's and don'ts, but that will be up to the sheriff as to if somebody happened to oops my bad. I'm not here to say, no, don't give them a ticket or don't give them a ticket. That would be kind of your calling. But at the end of the day, I think <coughs> the, the direction we're taking it to include the, the committee uh, of trying to notify everybody to assure that um, we, we put the word out there, we put more signage, uh, that we do as, as best we can in notifying these guys. that Because somebody coming from Guam may not have a clue right now until they make that trip. If they make that trip in Guam, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but but then just I mean that person he or she may or may not may or not didn't get the message. But it'll be up to the sheriff and how it got through. But back to the haulers though, uh, the haulers that are tearing up our roads. I mean the sheriff and others don't have any type of way to weigh the trucks to say if the trucks overweight or not, or the tonnage is there or not. They just see a truck probably passing and say, well, it's a dump truck. Uh, they pick it up and hauling whatever they're hauling. And I guess you guys don't have a bird's eye view to say what's on the back of that truck outside of <laughs> it's a truck. <laughs> yeah. So it gets kind of tough on, on their behalf to say, now should we stop them and take them to the weight station and, and weigh them to, to verify that? And in the event that this, this street that they're on, um, when are you guys there? You're patrolling it at one time. Like you said, you can't post someone there the entire time. So you caught between a rock and a hard place. So I think, you know, we, I think we, as a board and as, and as a director, I think we're doing everything possible to assure that these guys are doing what's right. But for those who will come up with, oops, my bad, we'll, we'll have to deal with those guys accordingly. But at the end of the day, I think the route we're taking is probably the best, unless there's something and some other suggestions that we take to kind of make it even better. I'm open for that. But right now, the technology that we have and what we are doing is probably, you know, uh, at its best as what we're doing. So I'll yield back. Okay. Um, the director Bell, you know, I like the uh, idea and the whole notion of what um, Commissioner Mulk here mentioned about the additional signage and also Commissioner Mitchell. Mm -hmm. But I also just want to make sure if you have we, and you probably already have put this in place, what about reflectors for night vision or with a little flashing lights or something to allow people like me who night vision is not my night vision is not that great so I'm just wondering what are you doing One of the things that, that we are proposing to do is to have message boards actually that okay, are so they can lit. see yes at, at see. both ends okay. of the road. Mm -hmm. okay that's good that's my question any other questions mm -hmm. thank you Cap number five, county administrator, which is the uh, county, county administrator, do you have any business at all? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So we have uh, on the agenda authorization to sign a memorandum of understanding with the City of Austell, City of Douglasville, and City of Villalica for the renumbering of street addresses on uh, Veterans Memorial Highway subject to final legal review. We have sent these back and forth with the city, City of Villalica, Austell, and uh, Douglasville, and they've all approved well. Two of them we have back signed. City of Douglasville has it on their agenda. I'm not sure when, but they have Same. legal and uh, the camp, the city manager has approved the MOU. So essentially just re-addressing um, and Ed Dean with GIS is here to help. Uh, if y'all have any, need any more information or have any specific questions, but essentially it's provide uniform addressing along Highway 78, change the name to Veterans Memorial Highway, um, the cities would be responsible for their respective street name signs for um, notifying citizens and business owners in the, within the city limits. And we would notify ours and we would install our street signs. Mm -hmm. Any questions for uh, Director Dean? Director Dean, Dean, you to the phone if you don't mind. From the Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions for him? I, I know we've been working on this project, we talked about it last year in 2017, so I know every time you see me I always mention it, but so thank you for moving it right along. Um, so you are in the direct co coordination, and I know this would help the fire, par fire department out tremendously and also the uh, sheriff department, so you're all in coordination with the, the information, how you're going to transfer the addresses, yes, how is that okay? Can you tell us just a little bit about it? or? Um, well, this whole project, once the MOU is signed, we have proposed numbers throughout the whole route that we're going to go to each city and say, this is what we propose. We're going to say, this is what we propose, and see if they have any, you know, <coughs> they approve it, if they want to propose something else, so we're all on the same page. Once that's done, we will hold two public hearings to hear back from the public. And then, once that's complete, um, if everybody agrees on the numbering system, then we will start. And y'all agree, and everybody signs off. And then we, in our system, would change the numbers and then send those out to the cities. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Vice Chairman Ross. Got it. But, and again, you probably stated, but just for the record, to close the gap. So we go through this process. Is there any encumbrance or liability to, and I'm going to speak just to us right now, um, for the community that's impacted? In other words, and I just wanted to say it one more time, but they're going to be responsible. The businesses will be responsible. The residents will be responsible for the renumbering, changing whatever impact that is. I mean, mailboxes, um, street corner, whatever, um, letterhead, anything like that. Where does that responsibility really lie with us as the county or with the actual citizens <coughs> with the citizens mm -hmm. now the street name signs on the corners if that's yes, what you're saying that's ours that's ours I understand. Mm -hmm. and, and it involves in the cities and the cities and so yeah and the right. cities are in right. the cities <coughs> thus the two public hearings thus getting feedback um, I'm going to yield that for now. I'll wait to pop here. Commissioner Guy? Uh, the wording of this, it, sa it sounds like you've already got a memorandum of understanding. Uh, it says authorization to sign a memorandum of understanding. Yes, well, we have the memorandum of understanding, but it hadn't been signed yet. But you haven't you have gone to the, to the cities yet. Yes, what yes, you have. Said. Well, yeah. oh, Since what we wanted, we, we wanted an M MOU that the cities agreed to go through this process. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't want to go through the process and then the city of Douglasville and or Bill Ricca and Austell not on board with it. Then we have the same issues. We have the same problem right. with the addressing on 78. Okay. So <coughs> we don't need to say for the process, to start the process of renumbering or anything. It sounds like this is... Memorandum legal. I think it's <laughs> fine. You think it's okay? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Well, what okay. he's saying is this: is this establishes aside from SDS, which is not overrun by this, 
this is, establishes that each city that desires to work with the county and pay its own share related to the city unless the SES provides otherwise to change the numbers. We have the only system that can change the numbers. So we'll have the public hearings. Our people go to work on the numbering system. They will then present them to the cities and if there's no objections, they'll go through an implementation process and each jurisdiction will be responsible for notifying its people. Your address has changed in the post office, right? And we, and we can also provide letters saying that the citizens or business can go to their respective banks or any you right. know, utilities company saying, hey, we have changed this address from this to this Veterans Memorial Highway. So we help them out and we tell them, um, most citizens we give, like it's a residential road, we give them like six months to change, you know, the signage on their house or their mailbox and stuff like that. Um, but this, in this case, we probably give them like a year since there's a lot of businesses along um, the more highway. And, and the block of numbers are already in the MOU, and not the individual, but sure. it's like right. I, my, my bifocals aren't working 10,000 through 1999. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. It's going to be on for about a couple of years now. So. But once we give them notice, you know, the post office will transition. <laughs> they won't immediately not deliver mail because the address has changed because they know they're alerted. You know, you got around this system, the address is changing. So they'll still, they'll and still. And it will be coordinated with the post office, the yes, AN911. Yes, sir. Um, so coordination with those entities as well. But the uh, businesses and the residents along this, this uh, route, they don't receive a notice that we're going to do this. That's, we will send out something when the, the public hearings are held, before we'll the public send hearing. send it out to all the residents and the businesses, yes, give them a heads up. Yes, ma'am. Because this, this may be kind of costly with some of them. Sure. Some of them, so. All right. Commissioner, you're back here. Okay, thank you. I think Commissioner. everybody knows that the, one of the prime responsibilities of, uh, of government is to protect the rights and, and public safety of, of, its, of its citizens, be they residential or business. Uh, that does not negate the, the resident or the business of having their own responsibility to their to their brothers and sisters in the community. So this is a, this is a joint effort in the direction of public safety. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have no problem with, with the plan. I have no problem with the fact that some businesses may have to use up their stationery over a year, or, you know, and then switch it over. I have no problem with that. It's just a matter of being part of the community and, and, and being responsive to that uh, to that need. Specifically, though, uh, I don't know. Do we have a numbering requirement for businesses that that their address be visible and clear and and uh, unobstructed uh, for especially for emergency purposes yes and, yes there's, and, there's a, and in likeness if you, if, you, if you can i believe there's an ordinance saying that you have to display the number on the business that can be seen on the road. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of times that's a three inch number on a, on a glass door <laughs> sure. two, 200 feet from the road. You know, you know what I'm saying is I, I would like us at least uh, county administrator, if we just look at that ordinance, see if we can strengthen that while we're in this process. Uh, if, if we're going to require some businesses and perhaps maybe a handful of residences on that road to, uh, to renumber, uh, let's, let's uh, establish a reasonable and good uh, ordinance is what, what's required. I can tell you when I'm looking for a business, not just in Douglas County, in, 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 but in, anywhere in this country, some places it's real easy. I mean, some of the businesses have, have numbers like this over their door on, on the facade. In some places, <laughs> you drive around for hours trying to find a number because they're, they're, they try to like hide the numbers. Yes. So let's just let's just address that. That's, I know it's kind of a side issue, but it, it's a corollary to this. So I, I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. And, and first, let me say, uh, Thanks for at least kind of getting here because I know this has been going on for years about the, the, the Veterans Memorial numbering that we've got. Uh, uh, but I'm glad now we've kind of put something in place, especially from a public safety perspective, uh, to make sure that everybody is safe because I, I know in years past, uh, the fire department running off trying to get to Veterans Memorial at 1919, but it's depending upon if you're Bill Ricca or you're on the other side of Douglas County, you could go to either way. So I, yeah, this is this is kind of, I think it's a great fix. It's a great direction. 
but I know it's been going on for years and trying to figure out what can we, what could we do <coughs> and how would we do it and how would we implement it from a public safety perspective. So great job well done that we kind of put something in place that's doable with Villarica and ourselves, the city and so on. So everybody can kind of hopefully buy in the time. Sure. And, and you said uh, legally you've actually had a chance to look at the whole makeup uh, and, and it looks like other than this memorandum of, of agreement, all is good. Yeah, well, we've looked at just the memorandum of agreement, but it specifically references SDS for any crossover segments. Right. But uh, as far as li liability, I, I don't see a, 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 I don't see an issue there under sovereign right. immunity. I right. think these things happen in candidly it's in the public interest to change the numbers because of all the problems they talked about. Right. Exactly. Actually arriving at the right scene of the yes of exactly. an emergency. Exactly. <laughs> And, and, and with the up and coming widening of 78, this probably is good that we're doing this even now. So I know this is somewhere down the road 100 years from now, but whenever that happens, uh, this will hopefully be in place by the end. And sure. <coughs> if I'm hearing you correctly, this is not done. No. We, we've got to get public input. We've got to get uh, all the cities to sign the letter of uh, uh, memorandum and so on. So. Once all that's done, then we'll start the implementation. Now let's talk about the implementation. Uh, for those who takes, take, what, six months or three months, or what's that time frame are we asking once we go through the public hearing, once we get everything kind of in place, we're gonna give these guys with the post office and everybody else how many weeks, months, or whatever before your number needs to be changed on 78 to be X. Well, once we change the numbers and give those over to the post office, well, every time we change an address, we send something to the post office as well. Got it. Saying, hey, this address has changed to this. So we will send this, goes out to the post offices. So as soon as they change, it's changed. So, so is that to the post office, to that business, to that home, and so on? Yes. On 78? Yes. Okay, so everybody will get that notification. And is there a particular plan of the time frame of how this would actually be implemented? Meaning, like, say, we, it's done and the change will give them three months, 30 days, 60 days, or is there, is that, what is that process? Excuse me, can you? What would that process be once the change happens with the number, the sure. numbering? How much time would they have to, as an individual, as a, a property owner, as a business, and so on, to, to make that number change? We usually give them six months okay. to change it on their business or their house, I believe. Okay. But on the, in this case, since it's been, you know, impacts a lot of businesses along that road. Mm -hmm. We've given them up to a year. Um, since it's amazing. a long time. I mean, I'm not, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's an extremely long time, though, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and you're talking about, too, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, I think. You're talking about the implementation of the ordinance to change your address over that period of time. What I think the commissioner's referring to is if you're gonna change the street numbers on Price Avenue, I just need to know what's gonna happen at some point in time, so I can start transitioning my letterhead and whatnot. And kind of, so sure. what he's talking about is like, what is the distance between these public hearings? What is the distance before the, the drop dead date when that letter goes to the post office saying this address has changed? What is that spread of time is what I think he's referring to. Um, I haven't scheduled, I mean, really, I was waiting until we had all these signed and going forward to start scheduling the hearings and then giving the public time to voice their opinion. Um, I would say- And, and don't, you don't have to answer that right now, but, sure. but put together that timeline and okay. share it with everybody so we can kind of get an idea of what that is. I, I don't want you to, I'm gonna put you on the spot and say, you know, today it's gonna be, you know, 30 days here. But sure. put a, a full timeline together, I would say. So, I, I mean, cause 80% of that is in my district and, and, and I know code enforcement and others have been trying to deal with from the mere fact of just keeping it clean and, and making those type of adjustments. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, that whole change, what's that timeline as uh, legal was just talking about? What's that timeline? What, what, what is your plan? So we can kind of embrace it and endorse it as we were making our rounds and having those type of conversations. So if you would. Okay. Yeah. So uh, outside of that, uh, job well done. And again, I'm glad Thanks, we sir. at least got some headway into this because like I said, it's been going on for years, you know, um, and trying to to get this whole numbering thing together. Because I know Spencer, Chief Spencer talked to me about going one place to the other and not knowing exactly where it is so that adds to their time response 
not knowing that this is now in Villarica versus in the city of Douglasville because the numbering system was all kind of crossed up and all that. Yeah, so, okay, well, job well done. I'll just look for that if you can share with, with the board at least kind of what that plan is. And, and that will include going through the uh, public hearings, uh, implementation, the, the whole nine, so that we can kind of get an idea of what that is. And so we out in the public, we have that same kind of conversation with them as well. Okay. And probably be good to kind of get this on on, on uh, <clears throat> DC 23 as well, you know, to kind of put it out there as well. So so that time frame would be good to be shared with you guys as well. So, all right, I yield back. Okay. Do have questions for Director Dean? <clears throat> Commissioner Dyer. <Dyke. clears throat> Just a comment, make sure you coordinate all this with the assessor's office and oh, yes. the tax commissioner's office yes. because we get a slew of mail. Yeah. We used to get trays and trays of mail because the address had changed. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Back. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Director Dean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tab with number six, tab number six has been removed from the uh, this uh, the list uh, from under the tab of business uh, items. Next, we have tab number seven, and tab <coughs> number seven is authorization to amend the contract with Carolyn Altman as child welfare specialist and authorized to sign all related documents. And it's Judge Walker here today. She's not here. We'll move on. Tab number eight, authorization to approve an agreement with GDOT in regard to a temporary designated truck detour route during the construction of Highway 92 relocation project <coughs> and authorized to chairman sign our related documents. Director uh, Valentin, please. Yes, yes Commissioner. This is the other component that we spoke about related to the truck route. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Georgia DOT has accepted responsibility. They are going to be doing some preliminary pouring of the pavement to see what's out there, and they are, uh, they have agreed to make any repairs that are necessary. Okay. Lord's been yielded. Any questions, commissioners? No. Okay. Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. Well, Judge Walker just stepped in. If you want to go back to the previous side. Number seven. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Yes. Authorization to amend the contract with Carolyn Altman as child welfare welfare specialist and authorized chairman to sign all related documents. Judge Walker. Welcome. Thank you. I have exciting news. Hey. <laughs> Carolyn Altman has worked with us for many years as contract attorney. And she recently passed the child welfare exam, but she wasn't just a child welfare specialist, had the highest score in the nation. And uh, we are very fortunate to have someone with the extraordinary uh, talent that she has. And what we're proposing is budget neutral because it comes from the same line item. But what we do is we have incentivized our attorneys that we can increase their pay if they become certified child welfare specialists because that gives them the opportunity to have the very best training on the science of child welfare as well as best practices, policies and procedures around child welfare because we are striving to serve our community in the best way possible. Um, Ms. Altman assists us as being the parent attorney in our drug court and she also has been a contract attorney for a number of years. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I had invited her to come, but it's winter break, and she has gone uh, with her children because I wanted you to have a chance to congratulate her because we have never had anyone in Georgia to have the highest score on that exam. So this is a first for us as a state, and we're very fortunate to have her. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, fellow commissioners, any comments? Mr. Vice Chair, this, this uh, agreement is drafted by your legal department in conjunction with uh, Judge Walker's review, so we're fine with the contract. And so this, so, uh, this contract is effective? Effective as soon as it's signed, it'll be prorated and it supersedes any prior relationship with Ms. Alton. Okay. And my last question is that, is there any other role? I mean, is she the only one like this that we have on your staff? No, we have a number of people who are uh, child welfare specialists that are working with us. But as far as our current contracts, I believe that she and Ms. Nurse are the only people that uh, have the child welfare certification. And I think we're still, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember, 
whether Talia is taking the exam or whether she's actually finished it and passed it. I'm sorry, I don't recall. But she's the first one of our contract attorneys in this present group. We've had people in the past that have worked for us that have had the certification. Very but good. we're trying to encourage everyone to strive for excellence, and this is certainly an example of excellence. Very good. No further questions from the commissioners? <coughs> Thank you. Just a, just a remark, uh, it's just another continuation uh, of the, uh, I guess, the excellence you present, you present before the community, what your department does uh, for, for children. And many thanks, and we're glad to have this lady on board. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. I very much. Back okay. Thank you. Tab number nine is next. <laughs> Authorization to accept the grant from the ACCG Civic Affairs Foundation in the amount of $2,500 for a Youth Citizens Academy and a man external affairs budget to cover the related expenditures. Good morning, um, Director Stanley. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, we received a $2,500 grant um, to fund the Douglas County, Georgia Civic Awareness Program for students. Um, we came before the Board of Commissioners on November 21st seeking approval to apply for the grant and we have been awarded. Um, this program will be one of the initiatives of the newly created Douglas County Citizens Academy Alumni Association. Um, we applied at this, for this grant at the direction of Commissioner Mulcair um, because these are programs that, he, that he's initiating for his um, Citizens Academy. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mulcair? Yes. Uh, there was a question of uh, the funding being uh, allocated line item for uh, the uh, Youth, I call it the youth program, just, mm -hmm. to, just, just to abbreviate it, uh, under the, uh, the uh, civic engagement. And uh, I would recommend that it be placed under the, the uh, Director of External Affairs to give it a closer scrutiny uh, uh, and uh, guidance uh, from her department rather, rather than just the broad general fund uh, kind of scenario. So that's, that's uh, uh, was that my recommendation. I appreciate the board support. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah. And, and really, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, Commissioner Mulk here, respectfully, I ask you to. So, are we saying that the Citizens Academy will now be under external affairs going forward, or just this just youth component of it as a funding mechanism? Uh, What's I'll, your thought? I, I leave that to the discretion of, of the board. Uh, my recommend, recommendation would be that uh, uh, the operations of the uh, government uh, alumni association, Douglas County Alumni Association, uh, receive support uh, for some things. And I'm talking about support, I'm talking, I'm talking about direct financial support for some operational things, such as, uh, you know, binders uh, for our annual meeting and, and uh, whatever minimal amount of supplies, so we're not talking about a large amount of money. Uh, this specific uh, money has to be allocated to youth programs. So there's actually actually two components of managing the, the funding and operation of the Alumni Association, and uh, that's how I perceive that. And we're talking about funding the operations of the Alumni Association for its outreach program in the community. Uh, you know, we're not talking about a huge amount of money I'll get with uh, our county clerk and find out what we spent historically over, over the last three years and I'm, I'm thinking it's probably you know less than five hundred dollars or, or something like that so we're <coughs> and it's typically just been taken out of uh, I think 190 but uh, we can we can refine that uh, line item as well if it's the board's uh, desire but look uh, forward looking too when uh, when I'm not up here to kind of uh, you know, coordinate the outreach to the different department heads and scheduling and so forth. I wanted to have a, a permanent place for it to reside so that it continues to be operated on uh, at the best and in support of the county commission and the county government. That's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, I do know that. Mm -hmm. All right, so then uh, from an accounting perspective, uh, this is a grant, uh, and though it's a small amount of money, uh, it has been reserved. It won't be, uh, while well, we supplement what I'm hearing from the budget from external affairs this is duly noted separate mm -hmm. keep up with that separately yes sir uh, we'll actually create a whole new line item in external affairs uh, external direct uh, 
Fictional affairs. Fictional <laughs> affairs director's budget yeah. <laughs> uh, will create a separate line item that um, expenses can be charged to, and we'll place this money in that line item. Okay. And, and then my last question is a simple one, which is as we mature regarding grants, is and, and I'll ask um, Commissioner Bolt here, um, does ACCG have a, a reporting expectation? In other words, I know what we may do just to account for things, but is there an expectation back that, that it may require a dedicated person? To, you know, it's not like a federal grant. You, I think you get where I'm going. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think their charge is fairly broad in, in how the money can be used, but it is youth focused. Okay. Uh, which is uh, a little bit different flavor of what we've done in the past when it's all been basically a voting age citizens who participate in the academy. That Academy Alumni Association now will be responsible and charged with utilizing this money to outreach into our schools. And the ACCG actually re recommends a focus on sophomores and juniors. That's correct. Uh, which I think is pretty smart. Would you want to elaborate, uh, yes. Director? Yes. Um, the, the, the requirements for the funds are pretty broad, like Commissioner Mulker stated. Um, as long as it's used for youth, that's all that they require. They don't require us to report. Um, the only requirement is if the funds are not used in line with our application, they have to be returned. So our application um, was pretty broad. Um, the money would just be used to perform some sort of Georgia Civic Awareness Program for students here in Douglas County or a Youth Citizens Academy. Okay. I'm good. Madam Chair, I yield. Any other questions before we move forward? Oh, let, me, let me elaborate just a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're not the first county to have this fund. Uh, we're one of the, one of the first. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the already existing probably four or five uh, mm -hmm. across the entire state. So we're in, to we're in the top ten for sure. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, director has uh, been very proactive in reaching out to some of the counties who have already done a youth program. That's correct. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel. We may improve the wheel. We oh. may we may go to a, a radio tire uh, here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dating myself now because most people don't remember a bias a belt and tire, but that was before radio tires. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. We, we're going to try and improve on what other counties are already doing. So, oh. so I yield back. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the commissioners from the board? Thank you. Right, thank you, Director Stanley. Um, tab number 10, authorization to accept the <coughs> Emergency Management Agency Homeland Security Grant in the amount of $65,000 for certain equipment and amend the budget. No matching funds are required. <coughs> Director Holmes, or should I say Major Holmes? Good morning, Madam Chair, fellow commissioners. This is a, uh, this, this uh, grant is a reimbursement grant, uh, and it will be used to uh, enhance and purchase items for our CERT team, which is our uh, SWAT team, as some folks would know. Um, the, um, uh, We've already, uh, $65,000, just to let you know, we've already got listed what we're going to get for it, which is a, uh, about 18 ballistic helmets uh, and 18 pelters. And what that means is the mic and the ear pad. And uh, we're getting two rolling shields, which are used in a commercial setting. Um, it's a big bulletproof shield um, that uh, we can deploy uh, in a business or in a school or something like that. So. That's what the money's going to be used for. Okay. Any questions for the board? Yes, Commissioner Mulcahy. Yeah, specifically related to uh, this type of grant, uh, we recently uh, have initiated a, a public safety uh, committee mm -hmm. within the courthouse, and one of the issues that's arisen is is the uh, equipment uh, of the courthouse staff. Uh, bailiffs and specifically deputies here. Uh, unfortunately, in this day and time, we see uh, too often attacks at the courthouse. Either, uh, don't need to go into detail, but we see attacks in, in the courthouse. Uh, is it possible for some of this funding to be allocated for uh, appropriate equipment here in the courthouse? No, this is specifically for tactical units. Okay. Um, to discuss what we had talked about, there is some funding on it's available to do some uh, equipment uh, purchases for the courthouse here, okay. but it would not come from a grant. That's okay, right. thank you. Are you back? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this one. Uh, Mitchell? <coughs> this particular grant, uh, is, this a, is, it, is this a new grant or something that you can do kind of annually, right? Or this piece? I'm not sure. Our 13 commander, Brett Devers, is the one that actually found the grant and okay. applied for it. So. Okay, got it, got it. 
Um, and, and it's specifically <coughs> for mm -hmm. okay, so, that's so you know. got it. And, and, and that's those are the strings attached that says this is what you got to do. And, and in reference to uh, Commissioner Mulcair, a uh, question could you look at these guys here in the building? Uh, those those uh, bailiffs that are here in the building don't want to. You know, kind of miss out on those guys. So I'm assuming that we're looking for those other grants that would hopefully direct that type of uh, situation that we we've been blessed not to have an encounter. Mm -hmm. But you know, to be proactive, let's kind of plan for it. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. And I think there's a lot of stuff already in the works. There it is. Um, I know some P. I've seen some POs coming across. Good. And we've been in discussions. Chair, we've been uh, talking with uh, Sheriff Pounds, and then. I've dealt with Lindy on a couple of things. I'm sure Bobby knows about it. We've already got a lot of this in the works. Good. And this year's time to having some conversation as well. So mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, just want to make sure that we're not omitting someone, but this grant directly and mm -hmm. what it needs to be and what it's all about. And again, this was no matching funds, correct? Or was yes. No matching funds. Uh, okay. Well, continue. To, you guys do diligence in finding these types of grants because there's a desperate need, and and, and especially using our state and federal dollars is. Mm -hmm. It's a must. I mean, and hopefully we can bring it home and, and do that kind of stuff. So great job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yield that. Okay. Any other questions for the board? Tab number 11 is authorization to the to amend animal control services budget for donations received in 2017 in the amount of $50,125. It's um, Director McMillan. There you are. Hey. Hey. Can you tell us what this is all about? Sounds good. Yes, um, last year we received $50,125 in donations. It was a collective of donations over the entire year um, through individual donors. So some of it was very small amounts and <coughs> $100 here and there. So mm -hmm. this money would be used to spay and neuter animals that are in the animal shelter. And we estimate it will approximately spay or neuter 850 animals. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board commissioners? Commissioner, question about it. Uh, so, obviously, fantastic fundraiser donation. I mean, that's that's material um, for context. Um, how many um, animals do we spay and neuter per year on average? Do you know? I mean, you don't have to know perfect, but just relatively. Well, we adopted out. Um, we, we asked that every animal that's adopted out be a spade and neuter. Okay. Um, last year we adopted out 1,260 animals and uh, partially through the year we went under contract with the adopters to have them spayed or neutered after they were adopted. Now we're doing it when they're adopted. So this year 100% of our animals will be spayed and neutered if they are of age to be spayed and neutered before they leave the animal shelter. Okay. Okay, so uh, well, that, that, that's important. So that gives me context that says that, okay, this will uh, cover us probably a year, but then what happens when this money runs out regarding the spay and neuter component? And is this money only used for spay and neuter, or is it food, supplement, et cetera? So can you just give a little bit more clarity? It'll be used only for spay and neuter, okay. and we now do this in-house. Instead of taking our animals to a vet, we have vets come to us in our surgical suite. Yep. Um, we hope to... Um, raise additional funds every year. We also apply for grants in the Humane Society that we partner with. We work very closely with them. They uh, help us raise funds. Last year they raised uh, $15,380 uh, to be used towards spay and neuter also. So we, we have to keep it up every year and raise awareness. In. It, it, Yeoman's job, and I, again, I have no problem with you know, we spent um, we invested in this, um, obviously, initiative. Um, I just want to acknowledge that if, if from a budgeting perspective, um, is that if we're ever short, I don't, I, I, I guess I'm asking, just like with food and anything else, this is a service that we're providing to the public. And if, in fact, the donations come up short, <coughs> how are we going to use it for spay and neuter, et cetera? It is an acknowledgement from the board that our policy is that we're supposed to do this, we're supposed to spay and neuter, which means there needs to be a budget line item, right? Um, else we're like, well, we run out of money. I need somebody to clarify that there is a budget that exists 
that will cover the basic functions of this animal shelter. And when we have donations and grants to offset that, great. But in the absence of that, to be conforming with our policy, that there is a budget for standards. Can somebody address that, please? Well, we do have a budget for the animal shelter. Uh, the span neuter is, a lot of it is on top of that. Uh, we do have some money budgeted for span neuter. But the donations help us offset the cost of mm -hmm. the overall adoption for the citizen. Should we fall short, uh, spay and neuter funds that are donated, we would have to pass that cost <coughs> on to the citizens. They would have to pay a higher adoption fee. Okay. So we're not eating that. Okay. I got my answer confirmed. I, I yield back. I yield back. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Mulcair. Let's take this opportunity. We're talking about raising funds, and uh, we've uh, done two uh, fundraisers with the uh, county in partnership with the Dover County Humane Society. We've raised uh, <coughs> over $35,000 over, over the last two years. I should mention that we have another party fundraiser coming up April 21st, which all, all commissioners, as all of you, are invited to. Uh, and this, again, is this money is dedicated in sharing <coughs> with the Douglas County Humane Society okay. uh, for the specific purpose of uh, spay and neuter uh, animals, uh, both at the Humane Society and at the shelter, but the bulk of the money goes to the, uh, the animal services. So April 21st, mark your calendars. Okay. Don't know where, but <laughs> but, but it's to be determined. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell, I didn't see you. Uh, um, for clarity, so our policy is that dogs and cats are spayed and neutered coming and going before we allow the adoption, correct? That's great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in the event in your budget, do you, do you have a line that would offset that number that where the donation don't carry that you prepared versus passing the cost of passing it through to those, um, uh, those that actually adopt the an animal, and I don't know how much that cost would be. Is, is there is there a line item in your budget that you account for that will help out in the event of this? We we have twenty five thousand budgeted for vet care every year. Okay. Uh, that would is that include and neuter or is just somebody that vet? would be vet care in its entirety. So okay, absolutely. if we have to take an injured animal to the vet okay. or provide care, we can use some of that money for spay and neuter, but we. Generally, try to make that up with donations Got it. for the spay neuter. That helps offset the cost of the adoption. It helps get the animals adopted out uh, more quickly, more efficiently. It it helps the citizen pay a little cost. But should we fall short of funds, we will <coughs> have to go up on our adoption prices. And, and how much does it really cost that would be a pass through to, to get and, and spay and neutering a, a cat or a dog or whatever? Is it, it, a, is it a nominal cost or is it like? You know, several hundred dollars or something. It's a hundred dollar full adoption fee price mm -hmm. um, that gets the animals spayed and neutered. We do it um, at the hundred dollars. Some animals may cost a little less and some a little more. It generally evens out, mm -hmm. but the hundred dollars includes the animal, the spay and neuter, the initial vaccination, and the rabies vaccination and testing we do in house. Yeah, and, and in most cases, do you guys do? Do you guys do that? Um, when you get these animals, or is it once someone comes to adopt them, that's when you start the whole process? Is it already tagged, spayed and neutered, need to be done, you know, in so many days? We, we identify oh, who okay. is not spayed and neutered upon okay. intake. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a 72 hour hold uh, to allow citizens to reclaim their pets. Mm -hmm. um, we post them online so, mm -hmm. and display them in the shelter. At the end of 72 hours, it's our goal to go ahead and have everybody already spayed and neutered. We want a complete, <laughs> complete adoption to be easy and available right, right out the door. Uh, if the animal is not already spayed and neutered when the person selects them, right. then it would be done and a later date would be scheduled so for that people. process starts immediately. It doesn't start, you know, weeks down the road until somebody adopts. It actually starts you know, whatever window you guys have, 72 hours, whatever, to yes. start that whole process. So hopefully in that whole time, in that whole process, somebody's looking to adopt or looking at it or rubbing it and getting licked by it and that kind of stuff. So. Yes, we want to um, make it make it ready to adopt as soon as possible. Got it. Okay, all right. Um, Thank you. I yield back. Okay, any other questions? 
You look like you had something for Mr. Geider. <laughs> well, uh, if, you, if I can, um, yeah, sure. feral cats. Uh, that's always been a problem because uh, I think the code says if you feed them for three days, they're yours. But, you know, people feel sorry for these cats that come up and they, they don't want them to starve, so they feed them, especially if they're kittens. What? And uh, then um, if they take them to the shelter, the shelter says, well, uh, you have to pay to have them spayed and neutered. Is that not well, it's a misconception of the code that says that if you feed an animal for three days, it's yours. The code states that if we harbor an animal for three days, it becomes the property of the county. Um, we encourage our c citizens to um, feed a hungry animal and call us for assistance if one comes up stray uh, so that we can uh, either pick it up or get it back to its owner or, or find the situation, uh, find a home for it. We do um, have a feral cat program, uh, some of the, and the Humane Society works with us on this. If somebody is willing to harbor a feral cat and have it spayed, then there are programs that they can apply to to have that animal uh, spayed or neutered. And we are also looking, uh, hopefully this year, at an additional grant uh, to secure just for the feral cats. So our um, We've been helping a lot more feral cats and a lot of them, a uh, lot less of them lose their lives now due to the Humane Society and the partnership with the animal services to help them. But I've heard that from everybody. It said, well, I called the, uh, the shelter and they said, well, if you've been feeding it, it's your cat, you have to pay for it. And that was something in the past. Okay. When I came well, on board, I, <laughs> when I came on board, I was like, that ordinance is for us that if we harbor an animal for three days, we own it. So if, if you have feral cats in your uh, neighborhood and they, you can feed them, but they can still call y'all to come and pick them up. Absolutely, yes, and we're going to try to um, get them to the best possible care we can because there are a lot of citizens that have um, some feral cats that they harbor at their house, and uh, we've been able to help them out with that. Thank you. That's good clarity. We are we are working on the feral cat situation, and I hope this year to uh, complete that program. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board commissioners? Thank you, Director McMillan. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to tab number twelve. Twelve. Authorization to allow the Metro Atlanta Firefighters Conference to utilize the Douglas County Fire and EMS Training Complex for its annual conference schedule for May 23rd to 26th and authorize the chairman to sign any related documents pending legal review. Board of Madam Chair, Chief Spencer's uh, at a training class, but he won't be here today or tomorrow. Thank you, Deputy Chief Zach Meyer. This is an annual um, training that we do with the other Metro Atlanta firefighters. Um, we sponsor the live fire drills at our complex. They come in, some of our guys help teach. And by doing this, we can actually get free training for our folks. So it works out well. The Atlanta Fire did some stuff downtown last year. Clayton County did some stuff, and we did live fire. So I think they can do that in forcible entry. But uh, like I said, it gets our guys some good experience teaching and learning with the other departments, so. Mm -hmm. Good networking, too. Yep. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners regarding this request? That's good. Good request. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chief. <coughs> Tab number 13, authorization for the chairman to sign documents for the Douglas County EMS to be a U.S. Department of Labor provider. <laughs> Director Holman. Yes. Um, from time to time, I think we've had a, a couple of, over the past couple of years, in order for our EMS billing company to be able to bill and hence receive payment for some of the claims, um, it's mainly government agencies. We've had it from, of course, we have Medicare and Medicaid that we have to sign agreements with, but this one is particularly the U.S. Department of Labor's Workers' Compensation Claimant. Mm -hmm. And in order for them to be able to bill and us receive the funds for that transport and future transport, we have to... Um, sign this agreement with them, our documentation, to be a provider, mm -hmm. be a, a <coughs> provider. I don't 
know if it's just a formality um, that they, because this is a U.S. Department of Labor Workers' Compensation versus a local or or a um, what do you call it? Private, private insurance. Yeah. Private yeah. Insurance. yeah. So I'm thinking that because <coughs> the other two, I can't remember what they were, but I know the other two were government related, like mm -hmm. federal government related, that we had to sign documentation in order to become a provider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other? Questions from the board or comments? Thank you. Uh, tab number 14, authorization to renew an agreement with Republic Services to provide transportation and disposal services for the municipal solid waste for one year at $27.49 per ton and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. Uh, Director Jenkins, Jenkins, how you doing today? Uh, good. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. This is my annual trip down to see if we can get our trash and garbage hauled out of the county in a reasonable amount. Okay. Uh, we had attempted to extend it to a longer term. Couldn't come to terms with uh, Republic, which we've been with since 2004. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, this is the bottom line. We're currently paying $26.95 per ton, and they're recommending a renewal rate at $27.49. 2.05 percent, a very modest increase, and uh, we'd like to uh, recommend that <coughs> we do this again. There are options, but not good options, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. It's relative to our neighbors, what they're paying, what we could uh, anticipate paying <coughs> if we do put it back out to bid. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Any questions or comments from the board commissioners? Uh, Director Jenkins kind of cracked the door open a little bit, and uh, we have uh, renewed this uh, contract on the basis of uh, being concerned if it went public, then our, our cost per ton would, would go up just because of the prevailing rate uh, in the hauling uh, community. Uh, so would you give us uh, just a, a broad brush, broad brush uh, answer to what, what is the going rate generally for this service? Today, and it is anticipated that all the costs are going to go up across the board in the waste industries, mm -hmm. whether it be uh, disposal fees, trucking fees, landfill fees. But Carroll County is right now paying $33, $33 per ton, which is $5.84 more than uh, we're paying. And this, the, the ironic thing is it's two different waste companies, waste industries being right here in our own home which does Carroll's in Republic is uh, in Paulding County is $34 a ton against our $27.49, which is $6.51. You start multiplying that out by 18,000 tons, 20,000. That's the, it's, it's variable based on how much waste we receive and how much we send out. It's money in, money out. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're not losing money, we're doing okay. How you manager? Vice Chairman Robinson. Right, so this is the enterprise. enterprise. What, what's the balance, roughly, how much do we have in there right now? I think at the last, before the budget year started, it was $800,000 on hand, cash. And by virtue of adjusting our rates, what we have realized is, and we don't have the numbers in because we've not been into it long enough, that it's going to be uh, up in the $1 million increase annually if things continue like they are now, which are landfill fees. Transfer fees and the sale of recycled goods. Okay, which again, thank you. Broader policy question. Let me say practically, <coughs> which is earlier this year we made, or last year, sorry, last year we made a, a decision regarding um, various fees. That's correct. Uh, and we made some adjustments, short term adjustments, just because we could. And the notion was that our landfill was filling up, and I think it was something. Let's say five years, three to five years, and kind of mystery. We had this conversation. This is not a, a new topic, but with these policy adjustments, which were short term, which obviously deals with the revenue side, there's still the physical issue of the landfill. <coughs> At some point, it's going to fill up. And I remember you guys made a presentation almost probably this time last year about you know this broader strategy about landfill and, and what do we do and how we plan for the future. Again, I'm going to stay on this. How do we plan for the future? You guys are doing a great job with short-term policy decisions. But as we think about this, and so this is probably the last little um, thing that you can do in the meantime, what is, where are we with that broader strategy that you presented originally that this was a component of? Sure. 
I think that what we have done is just try to wait it out just a little bit and see how much, how many years we're actually going to have left for the landfill to operate and put more money in the closure fund. Yep. And that closure fund's got two components. It's got construction and it's got 30-year minimum post-closure. That's what we're trying to achieve. And actually, it looks like, just based on the last, I forget when our adjustment date was, maybe in October, so in the last five or six months, we're seeing a significant increase in the net, net revenue. So until we get to the point we, we know what we can do and can't do, uh, we're okay for another five or six years. But it takes a long time to build a landfill or a transfer station or privatize it or do nothing. Which is to your point, you know, we have these moments of, of quiet to it, right? We're, we're okay, we're good for now. I think to your point, we're talking about a major capital investment regardless. Yes, sir. Right, so there needs to be some degree of thought leadership around like, okay, let's have a public debate now um, versus a reactionary. So five to six years, is this like five to six months will go fast? Five to six years can go pretty fast, right? And it's gonna take you to your point 30 years. So um, I'd rather not, you know, you get down five to six years and it's full, and it's gonna take you 30 years to build it or to do whatever, you, like that's, that's somewhat off. <laughs> and so, I mean, and again, I, that's the long term and I, I know that, but is there, and, and to the county administrator, can we continue to have this public conversation this year, begin to frame what these options are so that we can look at them <coughs> and get some deliberate thought around it. And, and again, this is proper, we're not kicking the can on the decision, we're making a proper plan um, yes, that sir. we can consider uh, because again, when I remember that price tag, it's like, ooh, right? And again, it, it, it may not, it, it, that's a, let's just do it right. I ask for your thought leadership, because I know we've had this conversation, so there's nothing new. So I'm bringing it back, like, okay, please bring something forward for us to, to, to at least consider. Uh, so it won't be reactionary for, for future leadership that have to be exposed to this, you know, way down the line. Can we do that? I can, sir. And it's, it's very important to note that most of the municipalities and counties mm -hmm. do not have landfills anymore. Okay. It's just from a very poor standpoint and the cost, they just transfer everything, which yeah. is one of the options that, that we put Get out of the game. Get out of the totally. That's mm -hmm. exactly what Paulding did. Now, they didn't shut their down all at one time. What they did was they quit accepting they C&D waste mm -hmm. except for county use only. That means the DOT, Parks Recreation, and everything that we, but they kept the landfill open because they couldn't afford to close it. So they're generating funds out of the transfer station also, which is probably a pretty good option. Mm -hmm. so but yes, sir, to answer your question, we'll bring it to you. So that type of framing, what are those options and sub-options, it creates so that we can at least begin to get in our, our spirits and our minds about what it means. So, you know, see the time come, we can be prepared. That's all. I thank you, Madam Chair. They, they nailed it. Thank you. Commissioner okay. Mitchell. Yes, and tagging on to uh, Vice Chair Robinson. Um, so we are looking ahead and trying to plan for this whole makeup of either staying in the business, getting out of the business, or sharing a portion of the business, which only makes sense. My other question is, the 2749, is that the, the hauler's new rate, if we accept this? Because I know it was, it helped me out with that number, like 26 something, I think it, uh, it is. currently, currently what we're paying through the end of May, and I don't have the exact right, okay. number right in front of it, date. We're paying $27.96.95. Okay. That'll get us to the end of May. The $27.49, which is about a 55 cents a ton increase, uh -huh. begins in end of May of 18 through end of May of 19. Got it. It will, it will be that number moving forward, though. That's, that's through, through 19. Beginning oh, oh, in 18 right, through one 19. Year, one year. Gotcha. One year. And we'll come back again and hash through it and right. see where we're at. Right, right, okay, gotcha. So that, that number will pick up at that point in time and go to we come back again for another year. That's correct. Uh, look at this whole makeup as to kind of where we are. And hopefully by then we've had this conversation as a board, um, kind of where are we and what we anticipate and what we would like to see in the future when it comes to waste. That's correct, sir. Okay, uh, and, and and how do you envision it though? Have, have you had a chance to think it through yourself or do you just kind of, you want to wait and? The, the best thing we ever did was adjust the rates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Then, it was not comfortable to do that. Right. Uh, 
So now, at least if it comes up and we elect to go ahead for another year, 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 at a 2% or 4% increase, we're still receiving some net revenue. I, I don't anticipate Douglas County building another landfill, in, in spite of having a thousand right. acres out where we're at now. Right, okay. It's just cost prohibitive and the regulations are just some crazy. Off the, off the yeah. chain, that's yeah. correct, yes sir. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say that if we elect to stay in the waste business, uh -huh. we want to be able to control to our extent the cost, it would have to be a transfer station operation. Understood, understood. But then we're at the mercy of the truckers and the haulers. Right. And the landfill fees are either out in Polk County or down in uh, right. Griffin. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, my last question. Is it better to look at this one-year plan versus a three-year plan or to lock somebody in like that or, or is it better to kind of do it year to year to year i mean we tried and monica with republic the, the corporate level wouldn't let them go past one year is there a reason? so we did try okay okay so the they rationale is that they knowing that this this industry is changing so yes, they're, they're like worried no. about costs going right. up and, and then they end up it'll, it'll fall on the bigger still, three-year plan right right exactly, yeah. exactly. okay all right. Well, okay. Well, I guess we'll have some ongoing conversations about this. Yes, sir. Again, thank you for all the work. Yes, sir. Thank you. I get that. Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right. Thank you. Yes. Have the, uh, yes. You have the uh, approval of the expenses before you, which is tab 15 mm -hmm. through 17. Just take a look at those tomorrow. We will review them. And uh, we, tab number 18, we have a discussion item, which is the WSA Board of Formal to be discussed in the executive, uh, executive session. Are there any other comments or questions from the Board of Commissioners before I call the executive session? Check to see if we have one. Okay. Uh, Attorney Bernard, at this time, do we need to go into executive session? We do for uh, land, personnel, and litigation, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Land, C and A. Okay, at this time, do we have a motion to go into executive session? Absolutely. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, take about uh, five minute break and then come back. Let me start over. That's all, I, I all right, but well, thank you all so much for rejoining us. Are there any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, I had something, uh, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then there are no other questions. I'll come to Commissioner Gutter. Uh, I've talked to the Chairman of the Transportation uh, Committee. I would like for them to discuss and keep prodding with uh, Whitestone. It's it was approved by the board over a year mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. and we're still talking about it. Okay. Could be a problem. We'll take that. Put it on the list. Okay. I'm sure. oh. Any other questions? No, I'm surprised. Uh, White stone. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got still it. Still talking about it. Okay. Being there are no other questions or comments, this board of commissioners' uh, work session is adjourned. Thank you. Mark, can we get this?